Okay. Please turn to 2 Kings 6, verse 1. Are there times in your lives where you were convinced that God had abandoned you? Or as you look back on your story, maybe perhaps through counseling or something like that, you think back on an age, maybe you were age 10 or age 12, you were coming of age and you were wondering where was God when this happened or my parents did this to me or, um, well, if you feel like that or you felt like that at some point in your life or you anticipate feeling like that, then this text is for you because it affirms to us that God is present with his people and he's preparing salvation even at the darkest and most dire of times. Uh, 2 Kings 6, uh, one, of, one other quick thing takes place in the context of the Elijah uh, and Elisha narratives, specifically the Elisha narratives, chapter 2 through 8. And uh, the nation of Israel is mired in idolatry and kingly incompetence. We don't even really even know the names of the kings during the Elisha narratives. And along come two of God's favored prophets to uh, make war on Baal worship and to bring back true worship of Yahweh. So read with me 2 Kings 6, chapter, uh, verse 1. Chapter 6, verse 1. Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See, the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan, and each of us get there a log, and let us make a place for us to dwell there. And he answered, Go. Then one of them said, Be pleased to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was felling a log, his axe head fell into the water, and he cried out, Alas, my master, it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, Where did it fall? When he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there and made the iron float. And he said, Take it up. So he reached out his hand and took it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word, and we pray for the illumination of the Spirit, um, without which it is impossible to understand in a saving way the things that you reveal in your word. So please bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. If you were in chapel on Tuesday, perhaps you heard uh, one of Dr. Byer's references to World War II, uh, the siege of St. Petersburg and during which time people burned pianos and such extreme things like that to stay warm and to provide for themselves food while the Nazis encamped around their city. And uh, I was thinking about that story as I was preparing this message because soon after this short story about an axe head is a, is a story about a siege uh, in Israel. And um, imagine the Russians in St. Petersburg uh, looking out, seeing with their eyes these troops, these Nazi troops, this mighty Blitzkrieg army surrounding their city. And all they can see are troops and no salvation, no deliverance. And all of a sudden, somebody proclaims to them within the city gates that you have nothing to fear. Um, and then somehow their eyes magically open and there's the Red Army this secret wing of the Red Army that nobody knew about, surrounding the Nazis who also surround the city. And salvation is surely coming. Well, something like that very similar happens right after this story with Elisha and his servant. Um, imagine having a whole army sent not after your town or your city, but for you. And that's what happens with Elisha. He is uh, surrounded because he is the enemy's secret weapon. He is the equivalent of, uh, flipping sides here, the Nazi cipher enigma machine. Without Elisha, Israel can do nothing. But with Elisha, Israel can keep winning time after time after time with, against the Syrian army. And so it's no surprise that the Syrian uh, king finally sends his whole army, complete with chariots and horses, to surround the city. And what connects these two stories for me, the story of the siege with Elisha, and the story of the axe head is what is uttered by one of Elisha's, in this case, one of the sons of the prophets, which is the equivalent of basically a disciple, a member of this prophetic guild that Elisha is the head of. And what happens in the story after, which we did not read, but allusion is good enough here. They both say, alas, my master. In the first case, it was borrowed. It was an axe head and it was borrowed. And then in the second case, alas, my master. All I can see are the Syrian troops. Where is God? God is surely not present. God is surely not here. Salvation is surely not on its way. 
Alas, my master, what shall we do? And Elisha tells him to not be afraid because Elisha can see something that the servant cannot see. He can see that God is present in a way that uh, the, the servant's humans, uh, human eyes cannot see. We'll come back to that story. I'm sure you know the end of it. It's pretty thrilling, pretty dramatic. And I think the story that immediately follows 2 Kings 6, 1 through 7 is important for interpreting 6, 1 through 7 because there's so little interpretation provided in those seven verses. We've got to look at surrounding narrative context. And I think this is one of the key things. The key thing here in both stories is the need for the people of God to see the unseen, to see the unseen spiritual reality around us, whether it's, as we'll find out, something greater than the Syrian army, the presence of God in its saving power, or in this case, Elisha, whose name means God is salvation, who can take something as seemingly trivial as an axe head and by the power of a stick make it float. So both of these stories address the need for seeing the unseen spiritual reality around us, namely God's presence and his salvation. So as I said earlier, this passage is for you if you feel like there are times in your life or have been or are or will be in ministry where God is not absent. He could not be absent. You're convinced, sorry, could not be present. You're convinced that he's absent. So this passage is for you because God is present and he's preparing salvation for his people. And because of that, we must see the way God sees as is indicated to us in this passage. Look with me carefully at the first uh, few verses of this passage in order to uh, build up to verses 6 and 7 where I'm hopefully going to make a connection to some of Elisha's predecessors to continue to get a clue to the meaning of this passage. There's different ways you could break this passage up, but uh, I'd like to break it up with three or four headings. In the first three verses, we have two different dialogues between the sons of the prophets who have already described are this kind of band of prophetic guys, disciples, learners, pupils that are following Elisha around. Elisha is a, a miracle worker, a teacher, and he has the power to perform miracles. So look with me at the first dialogue. It's, it's a proposal on behalf of the sons of the prophets in verses 1 and 2. It says, the sons, now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, see, the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan and each of us get there a log and let us make a place for us to dwell there. A proposal by the sons of the prophets to change their dwelling place. It's too small. Let us get something bigger. And note Elisha's response in verse 2. And he answered, go. And then there's an additional dialogue. It's not good enough that we have now a new place. We want your presence, Elisha. So perhaps they can see Elisha, the unseen spiritual reality already a little bit. If Elisha doesn't go, it's not worth going. Look at verse 3. Then one of them said, Be pleased to go with your servants. This is, uh, this is an earnest request. And look at Elisha's response. And he answered, I will go. Not only go, but I will go. All of that is sort of a background for verse 4, where we get the introduction of the real crisis. It seems that the crisis is a place too small for them, but actually the crisis occurs in verse 4. Look at the background in verse 4. So he went with them, that is Elisha, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was felling a log, here's the problem, his axe head falls into the water. And look at his reaction. He cries out, Alas, my master, language reserved for Yahweh alone. Alas, my master, it was borrowed. And then look what happens in verse 6. Look at Elisha's investigative questions. Then the man of God said, Where did it fall? When he showed him the place, that is the servant, the, the son of the prophet, he cut off a stick that is Elisha, 
Look at, his, look at his action here. He cuts off a stick and he threw it in there and he made the iron float. Now one thing I want to suggest throughout this sermon is something that Brian Auker suggests is that Elisha is a prophet of restoration. Elisha is in the business of restoring shalom to places where shalom is absent. He does this by many means, um, throwing salt into the water that's undrinkable or um, into a stew that's deadly or by healing the sick and raising the dead. Here he does it in a seemingly very trivial, very small example. And then in verse, and then in verse 7, the whole thing comes to an end without any kind of interpretive clue. And he said, take it up. So the servant, he reached out his hand and took it. Now, why do I go through that? I, wa I want to go through that to provide some background for especially verses 6 and 7. When I first read this, I was struck at sort of the similarity between Elisha and Elijah, and Elisha and Moses, but particularly Elisha and Moses. I believe that we've got to look at the narrative context, the story of the horses and chariots of fire right after this, which I've already alluded to, but I think we've also got to look at um, Elisha's connection and alignment with guys like Moses and Elijah. And uh, may maybe some of you know the story of Elijah and Elisha and the transition of power that happens, kind of centers around Elijah's mantle and his garment. Um, it's handed off to Elisha, but not before. Um, it's thrown down on the water and the Jordan divides, and then it's taken back up again, and Elisha sort of takes on the mantle of Elijah. Where is the God of Elijah? Well, now Elisha embodies the presence of Yahweh and the salvation of Yahweh. And I think one place this is particularly clear is with alignment with Moses. Now, you don't have to turn there, but if you want, the passage is Exodus 4. But more importantly, just listen and, and, and feel the uh, similarity between the language of throwing and taking up or throwing and reaching out that happens. God has declared that he is going to save his people, that he is present, even though to human, the human eye he seems absent and far away. And in Exodus 4, God appears to Moses after appearing to him in the burning bush. He appears to him again, and Moses answers, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. For they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? It's kind of a similar investigative question. Of course he knows. He said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it. And it became a staff in his hand. And so God gives Moses powerful signs to show the people of Israel that he has appeared to him so that they can see that God is present and working for their salvation and for their deliverance. And so I believe that a clue to the meaning of our little and seemingly trivial miracle that Elisha performs is given to us here in this passage and in the passage before it. In the next verse, Exodus 4, 5, the Lord indicates to Moses why he would give him these powerful signs. Why? That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. There's two significant things about that, and I think that they give us a clue to Elisha's activity. One is that the covenant promises are still in order that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is still on the move in a time that doesn't seem like they are on the move because what people see is suffering and oppression. It's been 400 years since the patriarchs. But by, but by Moses' powerful signs, Israel will know and will see that God's covenant promises are still in play. And what's the significance that that uh, the Lord has appeared to Moses, or that the Lord has appeared to Elisha. It's that the Lord has surely seen the affliction of his people, and he has heard their cry, 
because of their taskmasters. He knows their sufferings, and he himself has come down to deliver them. He is present, and he is preparing salvation for his people. And this is an invitation for us to see the way God sees. He has come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to, a land, to another land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And come, I will send you, Moses, to Pharaoh to deliver my people, that, they, that you might bring my people out of Egypt. So what I want to suggest through this sermon is that the narrator's alignment of Elisha with Elijah and Moses, but particularly Moses, along with the narrative context of 2 Kings, is that God is present and that he is preparing deliverance for his people. And he invites us, even in the small things, not just the horses and chariots around the city, but in the small things like the axe head floating by means of a stick, that he is on the move and that God's covenant promises are in effect and that he has appeared to his servant, whose name means God is salvation. Along with the narrative context of chapter 6 and the narrator's very intentional alignment with, of Elijah with Elijah and Moses, but particularly Moses, the man of God, is the wider context of First and Second Kings, which supports a message of God's presence and God's covenant activity on behalf of his people towards their salvation, their restoration, and their deliverance from their enemies. As far as I can tell, Ian Proven, other guys like that, commentators who have spent their lives studying First and Second Kings, the books were written within just a couple decades of 586 BC, the time that Babylon ransacked Jerusalem destroyed the temple, and took all the people into exile. Within a couple decades of that heartbreaking and devastating events, these books were written to provide a true interpretation of the things that had happened. Of course, consistent with the theology of Deuteronomy and books like that, which claimed that if the people of God forsook Yahweh, and abandon his law, he would drive them out of, their, out of their land. And he did that. But knowing that, does it make it seem like First and Second Kings is just a big I told you so? Two or three decades written after this, these devastating events, I told you so. I told you that if you abandon me and my law and my servants, that I would drive you out of the land. You should have listened to me. Look what's happened. Everything's gone. But as I've already said, I don't think, or as I've already indicated, I don't think that that's what First and Second Kings is up to. Within the narrative context of God's presence and God's salvation and connection to great men like Elijah and Moses, we know the covenant is in effect. We know that God is present. Even in a seemingly lawless, wild west kind of environment of 2 Kings 2 through 8, where we don't even know the names of the kings of Israel and Judah for sure. Where things seem out of control. Where there is almost in effect no king in Israel and everyone is doing what is right in their own eyes. And so I don't think that First and Second Kings were written to slam Israel over the head. I think it's a message of God's grace. Look, Israel, at a dire and dark moment, I was present, I was with you. And even when you couldn't really see it or see it the way I see it, I was there and I was preparing your deliverance. I was preparing your salvation and the restoration of the land. And it doesn't point to all the answers. Israel doesn't know how they're going to get back to the promised land. They don't know that God is going to raise up Cyrus and Ezra and Nehemiah. No, but just as the axe head and the chariots and the horses point 
to the unseen spiritual reality around us. So all of First and Second Kings point to that for Israel. It's hard to see because we are overwhelmed with the deliverances of our, of our, of our senses, our eyesight, what we can feel and touch. And the eyes of our heart are dull. The ears of our hearts are dull to hearing God's word especially his grace. And so the story of the axe head, as seemingly trivial as it is, indicates to us that unseen spiritual rea reality around us at all times. The Lord's presence through Jesus Christ, by the Spirit, with us. His saving presence, that he is working for our salvation and our sanctification. But nowhere is clearer in the immediate context of 2 Kings 6, 1 through 7, the meaning of this story. Alas, my master, it was borrowed as the axe head sinks to the bottom of the sea, the Jordan. Or as the horses and chariots surround Dothan, this little town in ancient Israel. Alas, my master, what shall we do? And look at Elisha's response if you want. 2 Kings 6, 16. He said, do not be afraid. Why? Why are you bidding me to not be afraid? And Elisha says, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. That's the bottom line. Then Elisha prayed and said, O oh Lord, Please open his eyes that he may see. And so we must see the way God sees. What did he see when he opened his eyes? So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And what happens after that is the enemy is actually ironically struck with blindness. But the point here is the unseen spiritual reality that the servant is not able to see. And so we too must look for that reality around us. God's presence, God's deliverance, God's covenant promises. Part of that is prayer. We must pray for the eyes of faith to see those things. But part of it is intentionality taking the initiative to look for God's hand, God's presence, God's saving presence. And so because God is present and preparing deliverance for his people, we must see the way God sees. Amen.